sorry, sorry, I missed that um, introduction. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, yeah, so uh, my name's Helen, and um, yeah, at SOAS we've been trying to engage with all of these policies that are um, really required of our researchers. And I went recently to an event um, in Belgium, it was an Erasmus exchange, and um, everybody was very excited to meet me because I was from the UK, and the UK is very, very ahead of the games in terms of policies for research data management and sharing and open access policy. Um, and that's meant that people like myself, um, I don't have like a technical background or, or research data management background, but support researchers to do their research have had to really engage with quite um, sometimes complex and conflicting policies. So in the UK, you can have a researcher that um, is funded by HEFGE, who um, have a requirement for open access for the REF, may have had RCUK funding and they have their own set of requirements for data sharing and data management. That, I think this is Nathan actually, um, who had an RCUK grant and then moves on to the EU and is funded by a different funding body and then is, is basically has a, a different set of expectations placed on them in this kind of policy sphere. So um, yeah, this presentation is going to focus on the um, basic requirements um, to meet EU funding um, relating to research data management and sharing. Um, I'm not going to talk about the open access policy for publications, but I'm very happy to at any time. Um, and um, also, yeah, like um, Nathan says, um, although I spend a lot of my time, unfortunately, talking about rules and requirements, um, I really strongly hope that um, researchers start to adopt these practices more generally and just think about data archiving and sharing as part of their research process rather than it being at the stage, I think we're at the in the UK, where um, researchers do it because they're sort of, in a sense, obliged to, but I think there are very good reasons why, why um, we should do this um, in general. So I'll just kick off with um, this. So, um, this is what the European Research Council says, that it supports the basic principle of open access to research data, um, and it recommends that all its funded researchers follow best practice by retaining files um, that they've produced and used during the course of their work, and they'd be prepared to share these data with other researchers um, whenever not bound by copyright restrictions, confidential requirements um, or contractual clauses. So I think the other presentations have kind of outlined some of the challenges in this area with relation to copyright, possible ethical reasons. Um, but um, nevertheless, the, ER, uh, the ERC does want, um, want researchers to engage with this topic, nevertheless. Um, and the reasons they say they do that is to enable other researchers to build on research um, avoid duplication of effort. That's common for all um, funding bodies. So there's a real um, commitment to stop researchers, I think maybe in the past, maybe more in the sciences, have possibly done the same experiments and not known other researchers are doing those things. And therefore, um, there is a lot of duplication of effort. And I think in the social sciences um, and arts and humanities, um, there's a feeling possibly about um, researchers going to visit um, similar communities, lots and lots of times, so how can other researchers benefit from, from other um, researchers in the field? It may not necessarily be directly relatable to research, but you could still make use of research data. Obviously, it makes um, research available to citizens and society and ensures research data is available in the long term. And I think that's the key mission of all of these funding bodies, um, certainly in the UK, UK and EU. I'd be interested if other countries have got similar kind of movements in this area in re relation to data management and data sharing. I know that there's some things in some fields going on in the US. Um, and yeah, this is an infographic. I've got all the references at the end of the slide that basically says, well, this is how you do it. So <laughs> the ERC produces. So you get funding, write a data management plan, um, gather data during your research, finish your research, and then choose a repository to deposit your data. Um, and then um, through their infrastructure, basically, um, the EU knows that you've done what you need to do. Um, I think, as we've seen, that this is a lot more difficult than this infographic um, suggests. So I'm not going to touch on any sort of disciplinary specifics. It's just going to be the basics of um, what you need to do, OK? Um, so first thing to outline is that the H2020 guidelines um, don't apply to the full extent to all projects funded by the ERC. Um, the requirements are laid out in the H2020 guidelines to the rules on open access to scientific publications 
and open access to research data. Um, one thing that frustrates me of working in this field, particularly um, the EU and the ERC talking about research data and basically um, scholarship is it's always referred to as scientific publications and I know that term has broader meaning in the US and parts of um, other parts of Europe but I think causes problems for all of us in thinking about what our research data is and if you're trying to advocate that in an institution like SOAS where there are no kind of hard sciences I think it immediately puts people off in engaging about thinking about about these issues and I know a lot of other people working in this field feel the same way. Um, so um, it applies, the um, open access to research data applies to all projects funded or co-funded um, for all work programmes from 2017 onwards. So I know that SOAS has a variety of projects with different start dates. Um, if you were funded prior to 2017 then certain projects um, opted in to the research data pilot um, and if you did, um, or you started in 2017, these requirements are laid out in Article 29.3 of your grant agreement. So that's where it sort of formalises all of these things. Um, um, interestingly, projects can opt out to any stage, under, uh, stage of the pilot under certain conditions um, if you've opted in. Um, so um, if you've got an obligation to protect results, um, if their um, open data is incompatible with the need for confidentiality. Um, I do think that is an issue in lots of social sciences and humanities, particularly um, for SOAS, the kind of research that we do at SOAS. Um, however, um, as you'll see in the presentation, um, the ERC still expects you to engage with all of these issues, even if you've got issues that arise out of ethical concerns. So that's not a reason to not um, engage with the idea of depositing data. Um, and if your project obviously doesn't generate or collect research data, um, then the, the rules wouldn't apply. Um, if you opt out, um, you um, you would have that clause removed from your grant agreement. Um, and interestingly, it says that projects that do opt out of data sharing for any reason um, won't be penalised, I think, providing that you justify it. Um, and also on your grant, you can actually cost for resourcing and planning of data management activities. So at SOAS, what we've tried to do is lay out, um, I've just developed quite a useful spreadsheet that sort of goes through all of the different workflow activities. I think that Frederica pointed out in her, in her last, um, in the last um, uh, talk then that um, really require a lot of time on projects. And what I've been finding with working at projects at SOAS is that sometimes that's underestimated, the amount of time it takes to transcribe or manage people that transcribe. Um, um, if you haven't done your file naming pro properly, the amount of time it then takes to get it compliant with the data repository. So it's, it's quite underestimated. So the fact that you can resource for um, data management activities, I think is really important. And I think we try to encourage all people, uh, researchers applying now, to make sure that it is described in data management plans so that you can run, a, run an efficient project. So um, I just want to say, if anyone has questions as we go along, I'm happy to take them. Um, as we go along rather than at the end. Um, so how does the ERC define research data? So I know there's been lots of debates about this in the talks, but this is, this is the official line from the ERC, is that basically it's data that underlies publication, so any data that's needed to validate the results presented in your publications. So that's one category of research data. Um, and basically information collected um, that's considered as a basis for reasoning, discussion or calculation. Um, they define certain examples of data which we, we've discussed, um, but it also says that any <coughs> curated data or raw data that's not directly <coughs> attributable to a publication. So I found that on some projects you might have data that very much relates to a journal article and you deposit that as one deposit, but you might have overall data sets for your whole project that haven't necessarily been um, underpin your, your publications, but they would still consider that as research data that you need to share. Um, I should mention that, yeah, all of these are the kind of reasonings that apply to most funding bodies, so even if I've said ERC, you could replace it with most funding bodies now, certainly in the, in the UK. Um, so the data archiving and sharing requirements, I've divided these into two different elements and I think there's some specific information that's quite useful in the guidelines for ERC grants. Um, 
um, about those two things and it will help for planning to make sure that you do meet the requirements. So um, research data should be deposited pre preferably in a research data repository. Um, that means a research data archive, which can be subject-based at an institutional level or a central level, e.g. kind of the UK data archive or Zenodo at the EU level. EU level. Um, they do require you to use what's really kind of a recommended data archive. Um, and for open air, which is where you report all your outputs um, on your projects, they recognise the re, uh, RE3 data, I never know how to pronounce that, register of data repositories. Um, I'll, I'll show a slide about that later. But that's where you can search for lots of different data archives and find out which one would be the right um, repository or archive for your types of data. Um, so that's a really good resource. Um, it says that researchers should definitely make use of data identifiers, most commonly a DOI. So when you're depositing data in an archive for long-term uh, preservation, then it needs to. You need to make sure that it, it does assign a DOI or a handle. So that's part of the requirements. Um, obviously, data deposits should include associated metadata, and um, you should describe the tools required to validate the results. Um, that's, I think, sort of in a way written for the sciences, but definitely we can do that for for social sciences and humanities as well. Um, so in terms of data sharing, so that's the bit where you're required to deposit your data sets. You can then make them openly available. Um, and the ERC approach to research data is as open as possible or as closed as necessary. So um, what the ERC doesn't want to do is researchers to just say, I can't share any of my data for these reasons and not either put it in a repository or you close off an entire data set. You might be able to share some of your data, but not other um, elements of data. And the ERC will ask you to justify that throughout your project. Um, when you do make your data available openly, it should be, uh, researchers should be able to access, um, sorry, I've put mine, it should be mine, <laughs> exploit, reproduce, and disseminate research data free of charge. Um, and you should make your data as open as soon as possible especially for data underpinning publications. And I think, Nathan, you've already done that, haven't you? You've put something in relating to your current grant that underpins, presumably, a publication, so, yeah. Um, for other data, if it doesn't underpin a specific publication, it says that you can share that openly um, further on in the project, and that's up to you for your individual ju judgment. Um, and that you can also um, put data in repositories under restricted access, um, certain licenses, e.g. Creative Commons, or um, controlled access. So there's lots of different options you can apply to your um, data deposits. Um, so I would make a statement, and feel free to shout at me if you wish, <laughs> what data archiving is not. So it's not really a project website, or even I would consider like a, a bespoke database, which I know a lot of researchers develop uh, for the research, unless it has preservation infrastructure, access control and licensing, um, DOI minting, for instance, and also um, from the ERC perspective, the ability to report um, reporting capacity so that the data repository tell, has metadata that tells the ERC that um, you've made a kind of compliant deposit. So these are really impo imp important things to consider. Um, and in Zenodo, you can actually um, archive a complete database. So you can develop a database for your project and you can, you can archive it. So um, I think that there has to be a distinction between what you're using for your projects for the life of the project, but data archiving commitments. And a lot of the times I, I speak to researchers and I think obviously would want kind of um, specific databases to exist for, for a long time. But even if, if that was possible um, and happened, you'd still need to make a deposit into a data archive. So I see that as a very different process. Excuse me. Yeah, sure. You said you welcomed the interruption. So yeah, yeah, sure, yeah. Uh, and just to uh, make yeah. sure that I understand yeah, it sure. correctly. So uh, as you might recall, I'm basically creating a website, yeah. uh, which I see as a publication. Yeah. And uh, by my understanding, uh, OK, since I'm working mm. in an ERC-funded project, yeah. uh, the data sets underlying that publication, which is a website, yeah. do need to be archived on the node. Yeah. That does not mean that every content which goes in the actual publication needs to be replicated in Zenodo, or that the website, as a publication, is mm -hmm. not 
relevant or not uh, uh, accepted by the ERC as, as project output. <coughs> yeah, it's, it's definitely. We're all kind of yeah. and the underlying data sets of research data. Yeah, absolutely. That would. But that does not mean that the website as a publication is irrelevant or unnecessary or unacceptable? No, no, absolutely not. It's just that I think the ERC doesn't have any requirement that that website would exist for kind of um, long-term sure, use in the same way as an archive, but absolutely, yeah. That's, that's, that's understandable. Yeah. It's just that my is not here seems to have the impression that the student website is sort of unacceptable and irrelevant, and instead of putting anything on the student website, we should just put everything on Zeno and that's that. I mean, that's, that's I mean, there are some specific thing. considerations that are not appropriate to talk about. So is the yeah. Okay. But yeah. Anyway, but I think, on, yeah. that, on the general point that yeah. you are drawing a sharp distinction between archiving and distribution. Yes. Um, traditional yeah. publications, websites, yeah. are all still about distribution. That's still a vital and important part of what we do. Yeah, absolutely. It's just that we're being asked to archive. Right, yes, and yeah, and yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think as well that um, obviously, yeah, project web websites serve a, lo um, a lot of different requ other requirements in um, funding applications, so dissemination, um, outreach, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So they can, but I, I've found that there's a lot of um, uh, confusion about a website also being sort of like a data archive or, or the kind of long term home for your data. Uh, and I think that that's something that we want to try and get away from. And certainly at SOAS, we're trying to really um, emphasize that point a little bit more. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so, yeah, so this is just to point out what I mentioned before about the um, R3 data, um, research data repository search engine. It doesn't have all data repositories in there, but you can search it by discipline. Um, it gives you links to the actual repository, tells you about certain requirements, conditions, etc. Um, but for the ERC, obviously, they've set up Zenodo to meet the requirements of the funders. So um, they don't, the ERC doesn't dictate where you put your data. Um, as long as it's what they consider to be a recognisable data repository, and this is the um, registry that they rely on to decide that. <coughs> if you made a case otherwise, I'm sure that they would um, accept that, but you would um, have to contact um, your project. So um, I would say definitely if you're in any doubt, any doubt use Zenodo. Um, obviously, some of you are very experienced with that. I've just put some screenshots of how you do it, just to sort of demystify the process. So. You register, you choose your files, etc. Um, obviously, you can put a lot more materials in Zenodo than just your um, your data sets. So um, you might want to link um, other outputs from your project in there. Um, the important thing here is that what you get from um, Zenodo is you get a citation, as Nathan mentioned on his project, and you get obviously a DOI. Um, you can see that there's metadata that shows which project um, it relates to um, and you can assign it to a specific community. So I'm thinking of starting a SOAS community in Zenodo, which means we could, um, Nathan, you could also link your um, outputs into that um, community as well. And then you've got the license for reuse. Um, so that's not what you get always in, in specific databases or, or the websites, yeah. Um, in terms of data sharing, here you can see how Zenodo works, and this is typical of, say, UK Data Archive, you can make your data open, you can put a really long um, embargo on data, and there's a lot of debate about um, data sets that contain personal data. I know at SOAS we have a lot of anthropological research, and um, it might be in small communities, and you could anonymise that data, but in terms of the reuse of the data, by anonymising it so heavily, that somebody can't be identified, um, you would actually, um, there'd be no reuse in that data. So you might want to consider putting a really, really long embargo period on something, and that's absolutely fine as long as you justify it. Mm -hmm. The important thing is, is that you've got a record in Zenodo that c people can find and see that you've got a data set um, related to your funding. Um, then you can have restricted access, so you can grant rights to certain people, um, and completely, yeah, closed access. Um, and then you obviously will choose a license that's appropriate to the reuse. Hi, James. Hi, yeah, could yeah. you put a restricted access on so that uh, if someone emails you yeah. and asks it and you can say yes? Yeah, I think that's the restricted access option oh, in here. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And the UK Data Archive as well allows that. And different data repositories have a, like a request button, so you can then field requests um, for reuse. Yeah, that's quite common. Um, so this is a very, very, very simple point that I use actually for PhD students. That, um, 
Uh, so, uh, so obviously, I'm um, sorry if I'm, I'm obviously pointing out things that you already know. Um, it's just about making sure that you can make that compliant um, deposit. Obviously, you need to identify what your research data is on a project. Um, Organise your data, file naming, folder structure, versioning and metadata. Um, one thing I wanted to point out at the end, I've put a link to the RDA, the Research Data Alliance. They're doing quite a lot of good work on metadata for different disciplines and they've got lots of working groups. So if you feel that there's gaps in the areas um, that you're working in, I think the Data Alliance is a really good organisation where you can start to shape what's going on in that and develop um, new standards, etc., etc. Um, then securing your data, obviously backing up, choosing the right file formats, um, checking the data, etc., etc., and protecting data. I'm going to mention a little bit about new data protection legislation that's really important, but that's going to be increasingly important. Yep, and then sharing your data. So. Um, so I don't know how many of you are aware that in May next year the EU is introducing new data protection legislation um, that makes, um, strengthens rules about um, informed consent and also brings in quite stiff penalties for any data protection breaches. Um, and this is really important if you're on projects that are working with any personal data or human research participants. So um, you need to make sure with consent that you are going to tell your research participants what you're going to do with your with their data in terms of sharing, but also how you're going to handle it, how you, where you're going to transfer it, which country, etc. And it's got to be very, very specific, and it's got to be documented. So that either has to be in paper form or through audio recordings, but there has to be now some evidence that you have consent. And that doesn't even matter, it's not just about sharing, but when you've worked with people on your project. Thank you. Um, and at SOAS, we have some new guidance in this area, so we've got a new document for specifically the practicalities of working with personal sensitive data, but also we updated our draft consent form to provide researchers with guidance to make sure what, what you should include when when you do consent. Um, if you do audio recordings, that's fine. You just have to make sure you give out the same information to research participants. Um, so for, I've put data plant management planning at the end, um, but I think that, um, and the reason I've done that is because the ERC is quite a good funding body because it acknowledges that data management planning is a live thing that changes. So a lot of funding bodies in the UK, you write a data management plan at the start of a project and then maybe never revisit it again whereas the, in the ERC if you opt into the um, into the pilot or you're required to um, you have to submit a data management plan um, six months um, after you start a project so it gives you time to start to work out what you're going to do and then you have to regularly update that through the reporting structure um, and you need to update it if you've made any significant changes so that you're making, uh, if you're collecting new data or you've got issues relating to IPR that have changed. Um, the EU's got a data management template, um, which is recommended, um, but not a requirement. Um, you can use a different template. Um, but um, what I wanted to emphasize is that um, if you're on a project now that's ERC funded, it's still, it's a good um, opportunity to just start data management planning if you feel that you've not worked out certain issues, I'd, I'd just start to use their template because it does um, really structure your thinking around um, data management planning and sharing. Um, and if you've not used it, there's a EU template in DMP Online, which is an online um, platform for creating data management plans and the guidance is embedded within it. And I've just, um, for this uh, event, I've created a easy template via Google Sheets for SOAS. So I've just basically asked all the questions that the ERC requires of you. So um, if you want to give data management planning a go, then do fill it in and we'd be happy to help you identify problems um, and try and fix them um, or improve your processes. Um, and the one thing that the data, the ERC does say is that you should keep different versions of your data management plan. So every time you've updated it, you should version it in the same way as you would with your data. Can I um, a yeah, sure, yeah. Your page says you have to sign into that. A DMP online. Yeah, so any you, any researcher with a U... Oh, no, you can log in. You just have to register. So you create an account create and then... Anybody yeah, can do that. anybody can do that. Okay. And there's also a US equivalent, which I think is called... 
it's not called DMP Online, it's something very similar, but they've got lots of templates for US funding bodies as well. And I think in the future they're going to combine this resource, um, and so that will be kind of a worldwide resource for online data management planning, but it's incredibly useful. Yeah, so this anyone is can better register. better to use this ERC? Data management plan template? Yeah, there's lots of guidance embedded in there from the Digital Curation Centre, so you get sort of expert advice as you're going along and filling in the different sections, so I do find that quite a useful tool. Um, so just to finish on some resources, so anyone who's at SOAS, um, please do check the new research data management pages um, that we've created where we've got the key guidance on managing a project when, when you've been awarded funding or you're doing your research data management planning and working with personal data, all the key guidance is there. And I've just put in the screenshot of the Research Data Alliance just to um, publicise their work um, and yeah, recommend that you get involved with that. Um, and that's a list of all the essential resources for ESR, ERC grants. Um, and um, yeah, because it, it's quite confusing, the ERC I find really hard to know what, what governs what project, but I've tried to pick out the relevant information for data management planning and sharing there. Um, so I hope that was helpful. And if you've got any more questions, let me know. Yep. <laughs> Yes, yes. Are the, are the PowerPoints going to be available generally? or uh, We weren't planning to because... It's, it's being videoed, yeah. Yeah, sure. might like to have this before this goes off. Yep, yeah. yeah, sure, I'll, I'll just share it with you, Nathan, yeah, if you can fine. distribute it, yeah. Uh, questions? Robert? Um, with the new kind of uh, data protection... Mm, yeah. Stuff, <laughs> we had to have a session at the museum... Mm. Um, <laughs> one of the things that they seem to think was that the new provisions mm. would we, would indicate that you were incapable of giving consent if your participation was dependent upon your answer to the consent question. So if I wanted a service from somebody and they said I had to give them personal details, then I had not given them consent for the personal details because I couldn't access the service. The service. It. And that struck me as a as something that was obviously aimed at commercial institutions. Yeah. But under the kind of tortuous interpretation our legal department is capable of, I could see that being a serious issue in an anthropological context. Yes. Um. <laughs> I'm not going to interview you unless you give me consent. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Therefore, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Just start again with right. an example. Okay. Yeah. So, if, if you're, so the, the, the understanding of our legal department, right, which, or rather my memory of my understanding of my legal department's understanding, so don't take my word on this, was that if you accessed a service online mm -hmm. the, where you've got something, Free TV streaming or something, mm -hmm. and they said we need you to put in your name, your address, your date of birth, um, all this kind of personal data. That company would not have a defence later that they had your consent for that information because you would not have been allowed to access the service unless you'd handed over the information. So you weren't freely consenting to them having it. Uh, you were being forced. Um, and if that understanding mm. is correct, I could imagine a tortuous interpretation that could hit research projects. Really, yeah. So what you're saying is, in order to use my data, you have to give me your name and your email address. No. no. You're product. saying, right? Yeah. I, I have a product. Yeah. No, no, but I'm saying, I have a website. Yeah. And my website as TBRC. You want to be a member? You have to give us an email address and your name. Yeah, the email then address that is, is forcing your consent. The email address is fine because yeah. you need it to provide the service. But it's you must sign into things where they insist on you giving data that you doesn't really they don't really need. Yeah. Right. Like um, Facebook. Yeah, like Facebook. Right. right. Essentially, the Facebooks of this world would. You know, it, it's. 
Is yeah. that? Um, yeah, so there's a point, in, and it was always in data protection legislation about <coughs> that pers the collection of personal data shouldn't be excessive for use. So you have to really justify why you might need the personal data. And so I think what we tell researchers is to really question, do you need this person's personal information? If not, don't necessarily collect it. But in relation to anthropological research, I think there's going to be a lot of um, efforts at SOAS and around the community to, to allay kind of um, concerns in this area. Because one concern is a lot of anthropologists say, well, I build a relationship first with my research participants before I would then document the consent. So, but you're kind of already in the community, you might be doing research, and then, then you present formally a consent agreement. And that's quite, I've heard, quite common practice in these kind of areas. So I think that those kind of concerns about do you need to now go with somebody and wave a form or a recorder straight away because you know how strict these rules will be i think that's yeah quite interesting there are interesting debates going to be had about this i think and uh, i all i know is the government it's going through uk government at the moment parliament and we haven't had enough guidance to really commit to what this yet means really but researchers are concerned for, for yeah. these kind of reasons yeah this is what it seemed to me when it was explained to me, was that it didn't feel like any of this was aimed at us, but that didn't mean that it wasn't going to affect us. Yeah. And yeah. that you seem to be saying the same thing, that it's not really clear. We're not, we're not clear yet, but we know that, like in the UK data protection legislation, that there are exceptions for researchers. Um, another concern is about withdrawal of consent, so they've strengthened... Um, the laws around when somebody can withdraw consent for their data to be used and we're not sure yet how that's going to have implications for research as well. So I guess all I would say is look out for guidance on these issues um, from research data managers at your institutions um, because I think there's going to have to be some, yeah, a lot of thoughts in this area um, but the information isn't there yet fully. <laughs> well, does someone feel like there's really something that needs to be urgently addressed in the public world? I, I, I sorry, I just didn't. I wanted to thank you for organising this event because um, it's been really wonderful. I think for people to share what they're doing and also, um, yeah, for inviting me to come as well speak um, about these issues. But I think it's been a great event. So, um, yeah, would like to thank you. <laughs> uh, well, then I invite you all to your last cup of tea. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully not.